The Tudor period is named after five monarchs of the same family that ruled England between 1485 and 1603. And it began when this man, Henry Tudor, defeated the armies of King Richard III. What happened next was that Henry married Elizabeth of York and brought together the two warring factions of the Lancasters and the Yorks. You might wonder why our story starts around 1500. But this is simply because this is the moment when painted portraiture became popular in England. The technique of coloured oil paint applied to a flat wooden board and then varnished had only been perfected in the 1400s. The results created a really remarkably lifelike illusion. Perhaps the modern popularity of the Tudors is partly because really for the first time in history we can meet people from the past face to face. Historically, this is a period of fundamental and really dramatic change and many of the consequences of those changes are still with us today. In England and Wales there was a reformation in religion and ultimately this nation became a Protestant state. The Church of England was established, the Bible was published in English for the first time and the country became recognised as a really significant maritime power. There were also important social and cultural changes, not least a flowering of literary talent with playwrights and poets, including William Shakespeare and Edmund Spencer rising to prominence. The geographic boundaries of the nation were also being contested and the Tudors considered themselves rulers of England, Wales, Ireland and even a part of France. Scotland was still a separate country ruled by the Stuarts. The portraits displayed here depict many monarchs and courtiers, but slowly, over the course of the 1500s, other men and women also began to commission their own likenesses. In room two, you can see the wealthy merchant Thomas Gresham holding his money purse, or the rather romantic image of the young poet John Donne, moodily looming out from his shadows. There were, of course, lots of different personal reasons why portraits were painted. Royal portraits, for example, were often exchanged overseas as part of the negotiation of royal marriages, as they were easily portable. While other portraits of kings and queens were displayed in the homes of the nobility, gentry or even ordinary citizens to show the householders loyalty to the crown. Patrons and artists began to invent new uses for portraiture and develop different formats, such as the full length, which created the illusion of literally seeing the whole person before you. Portraiture could even be playful, as in the strange portrait of Edward VI in room one, where what you see is just an elongated face from the front. In the 500 years since these portraits were painted, unfortunately, we've often lost the answers to such questions as who painted them, who commissioned them, or where they originally hung. The problem was that English painters at this date were considered to be craftsmen and rarely signed their pictures. They also faced competition from brilliantly talented foreign artists and in room two looked particularly at the breathtakingly lifelike portrait by Antonius Moore of the Elizabethan courtier Henry Lee. The reign of Elizabeth I brought a period of really remarkable stability over 40 years. Now Elizabeth never married although there were many opportunities for her to do so but consequently she had no heir. What happened instead is that her courtiers created something rather remarkable about her images and many of the portraits, as you can see with this one behind, created an image of the Virgin Queen and you see a number of portraits, including this one, which have lots and lots of pearls over the surface of the painting, which are a symbol of purity. In 1603, at the age of 69, Elizabeth died and the crown passed to her Scottish relation James VI of Scotland, who became James I of England.